When I think of where I am today And where he's brought me from Just a crippled man who had lost all hope With no strength to carry on Then one day I met a king Who invited me inside But I didn't know then at his table I died for the rest of my life I remember Lodabar I remember the broken hearts I remember the emptiness and loneliness that had torn my life apart I remember the years I spent so far away from him now here I am Yes, I remember a lot of all. As I look back on my life, all the things I have done. Just a sinner on my way to hell, trying to make it on my own. Oh, but then one day I met a king who gave his life for mine. And I didn't know then, but because of this man, I would have eternal life. I remember Lutter Bar. I remember the broken hearts. I remember the emptiness and loneliness that had torn my life apart. I remember the years I spent so far away. I remember a lot of all. Lord, I don't want to forget all the things that you have done. And remind me I didn't get here on my own. Lord, help me to see if you hadn't rescued me. I know where I Still be in love bar with a broken heart, feeling the emptiness and loneliness and tearing my life apart. But because of Calvary, because you died for me, I can see. Let her sing a little bit more of that. How, how many of you remember Lodabar in your life? I tell you what, that's, that's a miserable place to be, but I think the Lord the King come looking for us one day, aren't you? And I mean, you think about tonight, it's a Wednesday night, there's a lot of people not in church, and they're miserable, just all messed up in their sin, but I'm thankful one day that the King sent for us. We didn't deserve it, hey, we deserved all of us to die in our sin. Because the king came looking for us. Hey, you know what? For Jonathan's sake. <laughs> but hey, it was for Jesus' sake. The king sent for me. And uh, I look at my life and look at the past that I had. And I, I think about my brothers and some of the things that they're going through right now. And I thought that could easily be my life. But for the grace of God. I'm thankful that when I do think about Lodabar, it's a distant memory. And those bridges were burned by the grace of God. And what I have today is not because of anything that I've done. It's not because I'm a good person. It's because the King gave me everything I got tonight. And I can easily, hey, by the way, you can easily walk away from all that and mess it up. You can go back to Lodabar and live in a mess. But because the King, you don't have to live that way anymore. I'm, and I'm afraid some of us, we've been out of Lodabar so long, been in a palace that we forgot all that God's done for us. And sometimes it's good to remember that we're not there anymore. We're here where we are 
by the grace of God. Isn't that good? And so I know this is Wednesday, and you can say amen and shout on Wednesday, even if you've had a bad day. Thank God you ain't in low to bar no more. So let her sing some more of that, and then Brother Travis, come preach here in just a minute. As I look back on my life, all the things I have done, just a sinner on my way to hell, trying to make it on my own. Oh, but then one day I met a king who gave his life for mine. And I didn't know then, but because of this man, I would have eternal life. I remember Lodu Bar. I remember the broken. torn my life apart I remember the years I spent so far away from him now here I am at the table with the king yes I remember a lot of all Lord I don't want to forget all the things that you have done and remind me I didn't get here on my own. Lord, help me to see if you hadn't rescued me. I know where I would be. I'd still be in love with a broken heart. appreciate that good singing. I almost didn't make it to church. I walked in to change clothes and I think maybe they were doing the altar of prayer and uh, I hope to myself, man, I hope they pray a long time tonight because I have still got to get ready. But uh, I do enjoy being here on Wednesday nights. I understand something I didn't understand whenever I was pastoring a church, how difficult it is to work all day and then come to church and try to act halfway spiritual, especially whenever you're preaching. I drive a wheelchair van, and to be honest with you, those people drive me crazy from time to time, and uh, it never fails whenever you're supposed to do something spiritual. Um, there's always one or two people you run into through the day that make you feel unspiritual. I had a few of those today, and uh, you just tell them, you know what, you are not a blessing to me right now. I want to say all kinds of things to you. But I'm afraid to because I'm supposed to preach at the church. So uh, I'm just going to let you keep talking and I'm going to be quiet so the Lord's not upset with me. Uh, I was sitting in the car just trying to collect my thoughts on the way here. One of my favorite preachers is Brother Joel Logan from uh, Tabernacle Baptist there in Greenville. He's preached here before. I always enjoy it whenever Brother Tony brings him. I actually heard the beginning of their Wednesday night service, and I thought to myself, well, at least I'm going to get to hear Brother Joel preach, and uh, guess what? He wasn't there, and uh, I was disappointed. So some of you came to church tonight, you're thinking, I'm going to get to hear Brother Tony preach, and you felt the same disappointment when you realized he's not there. So uh, I don't want to disappoint you too bad tonight. Uh, he's asked me to just preach on a few verses here in Ephesians. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. It's been a long time since I've seen the movie Sheffy, but some of you uh, 
probably have. I think there's, there's one scene in there, if, uh, if memory serves me correct, where uh, Sheffy is preaching and he does a really bad job and uh, he just runs out of the church in shame. That may be me here in a few minutes. I hope not. So uh, you pray for me that God helps me with uh, what it is I'm supposed to say here tonight. Ephesians chapter number 1. When you found that, I want you to say amen. Amen. All right, we'll begin reading here with verse number 7. We'll read to verse number 10. The Bible says this, In whom we have redemption through His blood. Now if you're in the habit of underlining statements or phrases in your Bible, I want you to underline the two words at the beginning of verse number 7, in whom we have. Actually, the first four, I'm from Nebo. I'll get my thoughts collected here in a minute. In whom we have, the first four words, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Look at verse number 8, the Bible says, wherein He hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made made known unto us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we love You. We thank You for another opportunity. To be here in church, I want to thank you for the good singing that we've already heard. Lord, I want to pray now that you would please help me as I preach. Lord, I realize that I'm not the most spiritual person here tonight. I want to pray that you would uh, maybe just have mercy on me and, and maybe overlook that like you oftentimes do. Lord, I want to pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. I want to pray that you would open up the eyes of our understanding and you would help us all to learn something about your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight as we continue our study in the book of Ephesians, we come to verses 7 through 10. Right off the bat, I noticed two interesting things, not only about these verses, but about this chapter in particular, or should I say the remainder of this chapter. Number one, I noticed the punctuation. Now what's so interesting about these verses is that you don't find a period until the end of verse number 12. The thought begins in verse number 7, but the period is not found until verse number 12. The only punctuation marks that you find are commas, semicolons, and colons. Now, I'm no expert in the English language, obviously, but I do know that all of those punctuation marks indicate a pause in the sentence. So really what you have here in verses 7 through Uh, 10, or actually verses 7 through 12, I'm sorry, is one long sentence with various pauses throughout. So you notice the punctuation, but then you also notice the phrasing. If anyone has read Ephesians chapter number 1, you'll see that the statement in whom is found three times. It's found here in verse number 7. It's found again in verse number 11. It's also found in verse number 13. I believe the Holy Spirit has chosen phrasing instead of punctuation to divide this chapter. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. In verses 7 through 10, the Holy Spirit is telling us about benefits we have in Jesus Christ. In verses 13 through 15, the Holy Spirit is telling us about more benefits that we have in Jesus Christ. And in verses uh, 13 through 15, the Holy Spirit tells us yet more benefits that we have in Jesus Christ. He just uses the phrase, in whom, to divide them into subject matter. So with that in mind, I want to show you three benefits that you and I who are saved have in Jesus Christ, these benefits are going to be found in the first three verses. I believe that every person can better understand what we have in Jesus Christ by considering the following benefits that are found in verses 7 through 10. Let me say this before we get started. Aren't you glad that you're in Jesus Christ tonight? Whenever you read the New Testament, you'll find out that there are either, uh, there's either one of two places you could be. You could either be in your sin or you can be in Jesus. We know what it's like to be in our sin, but thank God we know what it's like to be in Jesus Christ as well. If any man be in Christ, he's a brand new 
creation, a brand new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So if you've got that new life in Jesus, these benefits are something that you have in your life. Number one, we have redemption. At the beginning of verse number 7, Paul is dealing with the subject of redemption. Now you'll find that word redemption seven times throughout the Pauline epistles. And every time that Paul uses it, he's dealing with something that Christ has restored that was once tarnished by sin. With that in mind, I want you to see four observations about redemption here in verse number 7. We see the subjects of redemption. Paul tells us in whom we have redemption. The we in this verse is referring to us. Now why exactly do we need redemption? You see, God created man in his own image. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 27, that Adam was made in the image of God. But when you fast forward to Genesis chapter number 5, there you see Adam has a son whose name was Seth. The Bible does not say that Seth was made in the image of God. It says that he was made in the image of Adam. So you have Adam who was the image of God, but his son Seth is the image of Adam. What happened? Why is Seth not made in the image of God? It's because Adam sinned and he tarnished that image that he once had. And that image that he now has because of his sin has been transferred to his son. And throughout the course of history, that same tarnished image has been passed down to you and I. The subjects of redemption. We need to be redeemed because we're not in the image of God. We're in the image of Adam. And in Adam all have sinned. And in Adam all die. We see the subjects of redemption. But then we see the substance of redemption. Paul says in whom we have redemption through His blood. Here Paul is telling us the way that a person is redeemed is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not by being a good person. It's not by being a Baptist. It's not by water baptism. It's by the blood of Jesus. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter number 1, verses 18 through 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot and blemish. The old song says, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I don't know about you tonight, but I am thankful for the precious blood of Christ. I'm not redeemed because of my good works. I'm not redeemed because of my good nature. I'm redeemed because Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary, shed His precious blood for me, and I'm glad to know that the blood of Jesus redeems us and restores us back to God, and that which was tarnished by Adam can be redeemed By Christ. We see the subjects of redemption. Then we see the substance of redemption. Then we see the strength of redemption. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Throughout the Bible we see different analogies that God uses to describe forgiveness. In Psalms 103.12 the Bible says, As far as the east is from the west, So far He removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 38, 17 says, For Thou hast cast all my sins behind Thy back. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am He that blotteth out Thy transgressions for mine own sake and will remember Thy sins no more. I'm glad to know that my sins have been forgiven. That's the strength of redemption, it forgives us for our sins. We don't need to let that get old to us either. I know I'm not preaching anything new tonight. This is nothing that you haven't heard. But it is a blessing to know that your sins are gone. They may haunt your mind, but as far as God is concerned, He had a memory glitch and He forgot every single one of them. When He looks at you tonight, He doesn't see you for your past. He sees you in Christ. 
And he sees what you are in Christ, which is forgiven of your sins. The subject of redemption, the substance of redemption, the strength of redemption. But then we see the source of redemption. Paul tells us that our redemption is according to the riches of His grace. Here Paul is simply reminding us that our redemption was made possible by the grace of God. Aren't you thankful tonight? the amazing grace of God in your life. The Apostle Paul was someone who knew something about the grace of God. When he was writing to young Timothy about his salvation, he tells him, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. I like the fact that Paul uses those words, exceeding abundant to describe the grace of God. I looked up that word abundant and this is what it means. To have or possess in great quantity. To be copiously supplied. The idea that I get from that verse is this. You cannot out the grace of God. You can even say it like this. God has more grace than a sinner has sinned. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 20, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Have you ever thought about what that verse means? That verse means this, whenever sin took one step in your life, grace took two steps. You may have done your best to outrun the grace of God, but aren't you glad that you discovered that you cannot get away from the grace of God where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, where wickedness did abound, grace did much more abound, where unholiness did abound, grace did much more abound. You could not out the grace of God. He still came after you when you were running as far, far away and as fast as you could from Him. That is the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. So we see, number one, we have redemption. Notice, number two, we have resources. As we come to verse number eight, we see that God has given those of us who are redeemed the resources that we need to live the Christian life. What are those resources? The first resource is wisdom. Notice what the Bible says in verse number eight. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all Wisdom. Now I want you to understand, when we get saved, we get the wisdom of Christ. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. That's simply telling us this, when you get saved, God gives you wisdom about how to be spiritual. Isn't it amazing that someone who has never been saved before has no idea about what it takes to live a spiritual life? As a matter of fact, that whole concept of being spiritual is something that's really far out to them. It's something that they cannot understand. There's a reason for that. The Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually Discern, but whenever a person gets saved, all of a sudden they know what it takes to be spiritual. They know that they need to go to church, they know that they need to read their Bible, they know that they need to pray. How do you explain that? They got saved, and then God gave them wisdom. The reason we don't talk the way we did before we got saved is because God gave us wisdom, and now we know that that's wrong. The reason uh, you don't dress the way that you used to is because God gave you wisdom and now you know that that's wrong. He's given you everything that you need to live a spiritual life. He's given you wisdom, then He's also given us prudence. At the end of the verse, Paul tells us that God has also abounded toward us in all prudence. Now the word prudence really deals with the idea of being cautious. I believe the idea that Paul is trying to convey here is that God has equipped us with the prudence we need so we can avoid the pitfalls of life. As a matter of fact, when Paul gives us, uh, as a matter, I'm sorry, as a matter of fact, the Bible gives us rather some characteristics of a prudent man. Listen to these, Proverbs 12, 23, the Bible says, A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. That means that a prudent person doesn't tell everything they know about everybody. Even if a prudent person does have the lowdown, so to speak, on somebody, they don't share it. 
Here's another one, Proverbs 14, 15. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. That means that a prudent person doesn't believe every rumor that they hear. And when they do hear one, they mind their own business instead of spreading it. Proverbs 15, 5, the Bible says, A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. That means a prudent person doesn't fly off the handle, so to speak, when someone corrects them. They're able to take rebuke when it's needed. God has given us the ability to be prudent, the ability to be cautious. I believe there are probably a lot of Christians who spend a lot of time in pits simply because they aren't using the wisdom and the prudence that God has equipped them with. Nobody said we had to live the Christian life on our own. A great deal of it is us simply using the resources that God has equipped us with, wisdom and prudence. We see the redemption that we have in Christ. We see the resources we have in Christ, but then we see the revelation that we have in Christ. As we come to verse number 9, Paul tells us that God has revealed His will to us. Now, the will of God is something that is almost mysterious whenever somebody talks about it. A lot of times you'll have people come and talk to you and say, how do I find the will of God for my life? Really, we overcomplicate it sometimes because according to this verse, God has already revealed His will toward, to, uh, to us. Now, there are two questions about the will of God that are answered here in verse number 9. The question of where God reveals His will is answered. Look at the beginning of verse number 9. The Bible tells us that God has made known unto us the mystery of of his will. Let me ask you a question. Where has God made his will known to us? Right here in this King James Bible. There's no excuse for a Christian not knowing what the will of God is when it's right in front of them. Don't go to your pastor and say, show me what the will of God is for my life. Go to the Bible because that is where you find it. You know what? You can open up this Bible and you can automatically find out three things that are the will of God for your life. Number one, it's God's will for you to be saved. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter number 3 and verse number 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what color your skin, uh, your, uh, skin is. It is the will of God for you to be saved. It's also the will of God for you to be surrendered. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 12 verses 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It's the will of God for you to get saved and then give your life to Jesus Christ. Then it's the will of God for you to be satisfied. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says this, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus Concerning you, what does that mean? It means that you're satisfied no matter where you are in life. It means you're satisfied when the money's coming in and when the bills are going unpaid. Whatever state you're in, you're satisfied with it. That's the will of God for your life. You're able to look up towards heaven and say, Thank you, Lord, when things are going good. But you're also able to look up towards heaven and say, Thank you, Lord, when things are going bad. It's the will of God for you to be satisfied no matter where you are in life. Those are just three simple things that you could find when you open up the Word of God. There's much more in there that God wants to show us concerning His will if we'll simply take the time to open up the Bible. We see where God reveals His will. Where is it at? It's in the Bible. You'll find everything that you're looking for. One of the things that's always been interesting to me is that the word success is only found one time in your King James Bible. It's found in the book of Joshua chapter number 1 and it's dealing with the subject of the Word of God. God tells Joshua that if he keeps those words and he meditates on those words, he'll have good success and whatsoever he does is going to prosper. 
It's no accident that success is tied to the Word of God. You want to find out what God's will is for your life and be successful? You better spend time in the Bible because that's where He reveals it. We see where God reveals His will. but Then we see why God reveals His will. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself. Do you know why God makes His will known to us? Because He's good. God doesn't let us stumble around in the darkness trying to figure out what it is we're supposed to do. Instead, He leaves it for us in His Word so we can find it because He's good. He's too good to leave us directionless in life. He's too good to let us stumble in the darkness. It's the goodness of God that shows you what His will is for your life. We don't have to figure it out by ourselves. We don't have to reach some type of level of spirituality to where God enlightens us about His will. The only thing we have to do is open up the Bible. God was good and He made it simple for us because He knows we're not very smart. Just to be honest with you, especially me. God would have made finding His will difficult. We would be in trouble. We would never find it. But the goodness of God said, no, I don't want you to be directionless, so I'm going to Put it in a place that's accessible. The only thing you have to do is open up the Bible and there you'll find my will. What do we have in Christ? We have redemption. We have resources. We have revelation. But notice number four, we have reconciliation. Now whenever we came to verse number 10, I'm sure I probably wasn't the only one who was nervous whenever... I read that verse. That's a verse that a lot of times and in a lot of churches is just simply overlooked and maybe passed over because there are some things about it that can somewhat be difficult to understand. But I know we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. He's the author of the Bible. And when you have a question about something, who better to go to than the author himself? You don't necessarily have to consult Brother Randy like I do or consult a commentary. The only thing that you have to do is consult the Holy Spirit. I believe verse number 10 is dealing with the reconciliation and Christ at the end of times is what we would refer to it as. Now, I want to give you just a brief overview of what this verse is saying. We'll cover it and then we'll be done. I want you to see, number one, the period that's discussed. When I say period, I'm referring to a specific time. Here in verse number 10, notice what the Bible says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times. What is the fullness of times? This is what I believe. I know that uh, Dr. Ruckman, I read some of his books occasionally, he believed this as well. Several other men did that I read after. The fullness of time is going to be referring to the end of the 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now we understand that the stage is set and the next thing that we're waiting for as believers is an event that's known as the rapture. When the rapture takes place, we know that Jesus is coming in the clouds of the air for the church. The dead in Christ will rise first and then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with Him. That is the rapture. After the rapture takes place, we know that the inhabitants of the earth are going to go through the seven year tribulation period. The Antichrist will be here on this earth. He will demand to be worshipped as God. There's nothing but chaos, confusion, and turmoil, but at the end of those seven years, Jesus Christ comes back to this earth with the church and he sets foot on this earth with the church. That's known as the revelation. And when Jesus comes with the church at the end of the seven year tribulation period, we're going to have the millennial reign of Christ. Now, there's going to be some great things that happen around that time period. The eyes of Israel are going to be opened. They're going to realize that Christ is their Messiah and they're going to give Him the worship and the reverence that He rightfully 
deserves. It's going to be a time of great peace, a time of great prosperity. The Bible says that the lion is going to lay down with the lamb. You and I will be able to go up to Jerusalem and we'll be able to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Much of what was referred to in the Old Testament will be reinstated once again. It's going to be a great time. That's the millennial reign of Christ. But after those 1,000 years are over with, the fullness of time, or the fullness of times rather, has come. What does that mean? It means that time as we know it is fixing to come to an end and eternity is about to begin. A thousand years seems like a long time. The Bible says a thousand years with the Lord are as one day. We can't hardly fathom a thousand years, but that's just really, in the grand scheme of things, a very short period of time. Once those thousand years come to an end, eternity is going to begin. I believe that is the fullness of times that we have here in verse number 10. So we see the period that's discussed, but then I want you to see the possession That's discussed. Look at the verse one more time. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now you see that there's two different types of possessions that are mentioned. The first is people. He refers to those things which be in heaven. What you have there, I believe, are the saints. Not just the New Testament saints, but the Old Testament saints as well. Those that Jesus brought with Him out of paradise. They're in heaven. Then you also have the church, which is the New Testament saints. Those which are in heaven. Then you also see property. He also mentions the earth. Now do you realize the Bible says in Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 22, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What does that mean? That means ever since Adam sinned and God put a curse on this world, the world has cried out to be reconciled. Another word for it would be redeemed, but for the sake of the outline, we're going to go with reconciled. The earth longs for the day. When that curse is lifted. We see evidence of the curse of sin everywhere. Whenever you go through the woods, maybe when you're on your way to your tree stand, since it's deer season, you notice all the thorns and the thistles. Do you know what that is? That is a product of sin. The earth understands that. It cries out for the day when it's once again going to be restored to the way things were in the Garden of Eden before the fall of man. And whenever Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, finally the earth is going to be reconciled to Him. Creation is going to be what God intended for it to be. That's the things that are in heaven and the things which are in earth. Now how does that apply to us? Well, if we're saved, we're going to get to experience that. We're not always going to know this world of chaos and confusion. One of those days, those of us who are in Christ are going to be able to enjoy this and we're going to be able to worship God in an atmosphere like we've never known before. The worship is going to be wonderful. So many times we're guilty of not worshiping God the way we should because we always have something on our agenda. You can't worship effectively whenever you're thinking about someone that you're going to meet For lunch, after church, you can't worship effectively. Whenever you're thinking about your job on Monday, you can't worship effectively. Whenever you know you have a doctor's appointment that's coming up and you have a feeling that you're going to get a negative diagnosis, but after Jesus comes and He restores and reconciles all things, it's going to be a time of peace and prosperity that we've never known before. And those of us who are saved are going to get to experience that. What do we have in Christ? We have redemption. We have resources. The Bible says He's given us everything that pertaineth to life and godliness. What does that mean? Everything that you need to live a spiritual life, God gave it to you when you got saved. That's a benefit that we have in Jesus Christ. We have resources. We have revelation. God doesn't leave us in the dark. You want to know what His will is? The goodness of God has made a way for you to open up the Bible and find out exactly what it is that God would have you do. And then finally, we have reconciliation. We were reconciled when we were saved, but really the reconciliation, part of it is going to be in the future as well whenever God 
reconciles this earth and you and I get to reap the benefits of it. That's what we have in Jesus tonight. That's the riches of His grace, what He's provided for you and I. Let's pray together, then I'll turn the service over to Brother Matt. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Lord, I don't feel like I've done necessarily a very good job of presenting these verses. I want to pray that maybe you would uh, be able to pick through some of my ignorance and uh, some of my non-spiritualness, for lack of a better term. And Lord, please let this be a blessing and a help to someone. Lord, I want to pray that you would help Brother Tony as he's traveling home. I pray that you would keep him safe. Lord, help the young preachers as they're probably preaching right now to the teenagers. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.